great pleasure to introduce to you today at our seminar, Robert Israel Oman. I could give you all a very long list of the accomplishments of Professor Oman, uh, so long that it will take most of the hour of our seminar, uh, but you can always look that up. So instead I will give a slightly more personal introduction. Um, as you know, Professor Oman is the, the father, as it were, of the game theory community in Israel. And many of the teachers to whom I look up were students of Professor Oman. And I like looking in their eyes when they look at, at uh, Bob Oman, because in their eyes, I can see how much admiration they have for him. And to see my teachers have admiration for someone like this only makes it all the stronger and more impressive to me. Um, and in addition, he's also a very wonderfully sweet person who always has time to answer all my questions. So since I'm taking up too much of his time, I give you Robert Thoman, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ziv. Uh, so uh, this is a talk at the One World Mathematical Game Theory Seminar. Uh, I think uh, a seminar is true. The uh, end of the title of the place where we are is correct. And the one world is correct. But uh, I think the rest of the title is in doubt. Uh, it's not going to be mathematical at all. And uh, it's only going to be, um, it's going to be about game theory, absolutely, but uh, not only game theory. Uh, okay, so let's get started. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, this uh, appeared uh, over a year ago in Nature, Human Behavior, and we will put the slide back on again at the end of the talk. So uh, um, remember, uh, if you want to look it up, uh, uh, you're more than welcome. All right. Now, so uh, here's uh, well, we're going to talk about economic theory. Now, you can think of economic theory as a part of game theory, or you can think of game theory as a part of economic theory. Uh, anyway, uh, um, it, that is the connection with uh, game theory. Game uh, economic theory could well be considered part of econ uh, part of game theory, or the other way around. But of course, although one contains the other, each contains the other. They're not the same thing. All right. Uh, so, uh, uh, why do economic theory? Why do we do economic theory? Why do we do game theory? Well, we do economic theory to understand how the economic world works, and we do game theory to understand how the whole world works. Okay. Uh, question. But economic theory assumes rationality, that people act to promote their goals. And behavioral economics has shown that they do not. They act by rules of thumb, which are called by in, the, uh, in behavioral economics, heuristics and biases, often with poor results. So uh, we'd like to uh, do a uh, synthesis. We'd like to uh, take economic theory and uh, behavioral economics, and we'd like to, um, how does one say, reconcile them, okay? And that's called a synthesis. That was called by the philosopher Hegel, who lived uh, well over 200 years ago. Uh, and and uh, he says there's a thesis, somebody suggests a thesis, and then somebody says, no, that's not correct, that's an answer. Uh, and uh, he suggests, uh, he says that's not correct, and he gives good reasons for it. And then uh, one comes up with a synthesis. It's a, it's a uh, um, uh, uh, common uh, um, um, process in science. And uh, uh, that's what we're going to try to do over here. So what's the thesis? The thesis is economic theory, rationality, that people act to promote their goals. And then comes the antithesis, 
uh, the behavioral econom economists say, no, that's not correct. People behave irrationally. They act by rules of thumb, often with poor results. And we're going to come with a synthesis. And the synthesis is called rule rationality. It's between rationality and irrationality. People act by rules of thumb that usually, but not always, promote their goals. So in other words, they don't figure things out rationally, yeah, but they act by rules of thumb. And these rules of thumb, as it turns out, usually do prefer. So it's not that people act to promote their goals, and it is, uh, uh, but, but it turns out that they promote their goals. The people act in a way which promotes their goals, okay? Uh, and what they say is that, uh, what uh, uh, the, uh, the behavioral economists say, they behave irration irrationally, they act by rules of thumb, that's correct, but often with poor results, that's incorrect. It's usually with good results. So the conclusion is that economic theory is relevant after all. Why is it relevant? Because although people don't act to promote their goals, they do in fact promote their goals. So uh, uh, economic theory, which says what happens when people promote their goals is relevant after all. Now, we don't claim priority for the observation that, uh, that the rules usually promote people's goals. In fact, the people that uh, first said this were none other than Tversky and Kahneman themselves. Okay, the high priests of uh, behavioral economics uh, they were the first right in their first seminal paper in science, 1974. Well, we're uh, coming on the 50th anniversary, the golden wedding anniversary of behavioral economics. And they said, in general, these heuristics are quite useful, but sometimes they lead to severe and systematic errors. Now, the point is that uh, 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 they, uh, behavioral economics has uh, traditionally and systematically uh, emphasized the sometimes, okay? And we are interested in this lecture in uh, emphasizing the in general, okay? Now, they were the first to say this, but they were not the last. It, 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 again, we don't have priority for that uh, observation that the rules usually promote people's goals because it was said again 20 years later. Uh, they, it was uh, uh, published, these heuristics are often useful, but they sometimes lead to characteristic errors or biases, essentially the same thing. And guess who said that? It wasn't Tversky and Kahneman. It was Kahneman and Tversky. Okay, they said this in the Psychological Review in 1996, over 20 uh, years later. They re-emphasize this, and I think they still say that today. So the, I think the bottom line of this talk is that we want to emphasize the often the in general, rather than the sometimes. So since it's not new, what is new today? Behavioral economics dwells exclusively on the sometimes, the severe and systematic errors where the heuristics do not work. In our humble opinion, the insight that behavioral economics yields into the in general, the behavioral economics yields into the in general. In other words, we're gonna talk about the the insight that we get from behavioral economics, not from figuring things out, into the in general, where the heuristics do work is much more important. And 
we do claim priority on this observation. When do the rules lead to severe and systematic errors? Are we go, we're going to analyze this. Some, they, they usually uh, uh, they usually work well, and sometimes they you uh, lead to severe and systematic errors. When is that? Oh, we're going to try to put our finger on that, and the answer is in exceptional or contrived situations. And we're going to. The reason for that is why why do they lead to severe and systematic errors in exceptional or contrived situation? The answer is because the rules, which were not consciously adopted did not spring from nowhere, okay? These are rules of thumb, the heuristics and biases. We're gonna have many examples of this uh, in, the, uh, in the next uh, 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 half an hour or so, okay? The rules evolved biologically or culturally. In other words, they were learned. Evolution does not work on the exceptional or contrived situation. Evolution uh, works on what is usual. It works by survival of the fittest. A rule survives, in other words, it's adopted, if and only if it works well when applied repeatedly, okay? That's what makes a rule survive. That's what makes a rule get adopted. An occasional instance where it does not work has no effect. And of course, a contrived situation, like many of the situations that the behavioral economists study, certainly has no effect since it never occurs in practice, okay? All right. Now, we, uh, we are gonna devote the rest of this talk to examples. And we have a long list of examples, okay? And let me just put them down over here one by one. Overeating, the ultimatum game. The difference between 100% versus 90, uh, and 99%. This is a favorite example of the behavioral economist, yes? that there's, there should be no difference between those two, right? Between certainty and 99%, there should be no difference because, you know, the 1%, the 1%, uh, um, the 1 uh, in probability that's lost is not, not uh, significant in practice. Risk aversion, the endowment effect, uh, Dick Taylor, a large part of his Nobel Prize was for the endowment effect. Uh, bees, artificial flowers, and nectar. This is a, an experiment that was carried out about 40 years ago, and uh, where uh, bees behave irrationally. We have the probability matching, which is perhaps the oldest example of behavioral economics. It dates back to the 50s of the last century. We have people who choose a higher probability of getting killed in combat, okay? This is not an experiment. This is uh, something that actually happened. And we have to understand why people choose a higher probability. They're not, uh, fed, uh, they're not uh, what's it called? Uh, um, <laughs> they're not terrorists, yeah? They, they don't do this for ideological reasons. We have the anchoring effect. We have Reinhard Selton's umbrella. So Reinhard Selton uh, went around in the Negev Desert in southern Israel in the summer with an umbrella, okay? Uh, we have to understand why he did that. And he, he was the ultimate uh, uh, rational person, although he was also one of the uh, fathers of behavioral economics. We have New York City taxi drivers. We have not buying subsidized flood insurance focusing, generosity, sunk costs, the cashmere sweater of, uh, of Dick Taylor, hyperbolic discounting, and the, the uh, favorite, the most uh, 
popular example of behavioral economics. Linda, if we get to that, uh, we can, uh, we will discuss it. I mean, many of you may know about this example. If you don't, you can ask for it. At some stage, I will uh, open the floor and add, ask people to say which of these examples they want to hear. But first, let me present some of them. Overeating. Okay, that's irrational. <laughs> okay. The behavior is that obese people often overeat. Now, this is irrational. Uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not healthy for them. Uh, and uh, why do they do this? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a prime example of uh, behavioral economics. Now, what is the rule? What's the rule that we're talking about? The, the, the rule of thumb, yes? Eat when you're hungry, eat tasty food. That's the rule, okay? It's not figure things out what, what, what's good for you, it's eat when you're hungry. Analysis. Though we need food for energy, growth, and various vital bodily functions, that is not what makes us eat. We eat because we're hungry and or enjoy food. Now, hunger and food enjoyment are mechanisms that evolved in order to motivate us to eat. Okay, uh, we don't eat because we, we, we need energy. That, that's the real, that is the function of eating. Okay, that is the underlying reason that we have to eat. That is the adaptive uh, f function of eating. But, but we don't think things over. We don't think things through. Just like in many of the uh, examples of behavioral economics, uh, we don't uh, analyze our needs. What is what 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 we want to to uh, what we want to promote. We go by rules of thumb. And the rule of thumb over here is eat hunger and eating tasty food. And these mechanisms evolve in order to motivate us to eat, okay? Na nature made these things evolve. And because people who didn't eat or organisms that didn't eat, yeah, didn't survive. So you had to have some reason to get people to eat. But evolution has not yet had time to take account of the sedentary nature of much of modern life. Okay? Uh, these things, hunger and enjoyment of food, they evolved over hundreds of millions of years. Okay? And uh, modern life is only a couple of hundred years old or something like that. And uh, so, uh, so uh, obesity was not in ancient times very common. By the way, you go to China, you see, or, or to India, and you see these temples, and in these temples have uh, these rich people with enormous bellies, yes, okay? And so this is not something which is just modern, but the, 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 uh, the, the fact that it's so common that one sees so many obese people, that is something modern. And uh, uh, evolutionarily, obesity is exceptional. So the rule is rational, in spite of its irrational consequences for the obese. And this is a sort of a, an, a, a typical example, okay? It's not about economics, but we'll see that the examples in economics fit this, uh, um, uh, fit this uh, uh, pattern, okay? All right, let's uh, uh, take another example. The ultimatum game. I think most of us are pretty familiar with the ultimatum game, but let me just spell out what it is. The game has two players, the proposer and the responder. And they must divide a hundred dollars. 
okay? Now this is a typical example of it. It's been done with, uh, it's a typical sum. It's been done with all kinds of sums, but let's, uh, the, I think the original sum was 10 marks, but it's been done with larger amounts also, there's $100 and, uh, and even larger amounts. And uh, so we'll take the $100. If they agree how to divide, each gets his agreed share. If not, both get nothing. So this, at this point, it's a, it's a simple bargaining game, okay? But now comes the unusual aspect. They sit at computers in separate rooms and cannot communicate directly, okay? The proposal starts by making a numerical offer to the responder without words. He just writes on in the, into the computer, I'm offering you a split of 50-50. I'm offering you a split of 90-10. In other words, I get 90, you get 10. Uh, something like that, without words. The responder responds by clicking yes or no. No other response is possible. The game is then over. The players get their payoffs, if any, and leave by separate doors. Okay, so now if the responder responded no, then nobody gets anything. They never see each other, nor learn each other's identity. They never see each other at all. It's not that they never see each other again because they didn't see each other this time also. They never learn each other's identity. The subjects are students, not particularly long on money. Okay, what's the behavior? The behavior is most proposals offer around $35. In other words, they offer a split of around 65 to 35. Considerably smaller offers, say 80, 20, are rejected. Okay. Now, What's the rule? Why does the uh, responder reject as much as $20? The rule is don't let people kick you in the stomach, okay? That's the rule the responder uses. Reject lopsided offers, okay? That's his rule. Now let's do an analysis of this. The mechanism for executing the rule, or the, uh, like hunger for eating, are feelings of wounded pride, insult, desire for revenge, honor. Those are, that's like hunger, yeah. Uh, this, this is uh, stuff that evolved. The rule and its mechanism evolved in natural scenarios where the negotiators know each other, okay? If in such scenarios you accept lopsided offers, you'll get a reputation for doing so. And in the future, you'll get only such offers, okay? You'll get a reputation for accepting lopsided offers and this gives a, uh, an incentive to the proposer to give you a lopsided offer because he naturally wants more. So if you, if you are known that you accept lopsided offers, so it's not worthwhile. So you, uh, you, re you develop a rule. So in such a case, rejecting is highly rational when you are in that kind of situation. But you know, people did not figure this out, all right? They didn't figure this out, just like they didn't figure out that if they want to uh, survive, they have to eat, okay? People eat because they're hungry. They don't eat because they want to have energy, it's not, or they want to grow, or they want to get calcium for their bones. They don't eat because of that. So they, they, they eat because they're hungry. And here, 
the, uh, the feelings of wounded pride are mechanisms for getting uh, reasonable offers in general, okay? In the contrived artificial ultimatum game, reputational effects don't apply as the players are totally anonymous. But the rule and its mechanism evolved in natural situations where they do apply. The rule is rational in spite of its irrationality in the contrived ultimatum game, okay? So uh, the rule is, it, the, the, the rule uh, um, is in general a good rule, okay? Now the, 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 uh, the ultimatum game is a beautiful experiment. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, conceived by Werner Goethe and, and associates. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and it shows that people uh, on the face of it uh, act irrationally. But the point is that the rule leads to a rational result in situations which are not contrived because it evolved. Uh, it, it, it wasn't figured out, it evolved. And that is why in a contrived situation, in an unusual situation like Tversky and Kahneman say, in, in the sometimes, it doesn't work. All right, let's take another uh, uh, example. We are talking about 100% versus 99%, all right? Behavior, $100,000 with certainty might be preferred to a gamble yielding $150,000 with probability in 99, uh, 99% and nothing otherwise, okay? In experiments, you, you, uh, you might very well get this. These actual numbers are contrived, but they, uh, uh, they are, uh, are you know, were invented for the purpose of this lecture and the purpose of the paper that I published that, that uh, I referred to before. But there are other uh, numbers with the same effect. I, I did this with, with uh, uh, purposely because it, it's very stark. Actually, if you go to a person and say, I give you $100,000 with certainty, you want that or you want $150,000 with 99% probability, I think it's quite possible that people will prefer, uh, you know what, give me the $100,000, <laughs> okay? Just uh, let's, uh, let's not fool around, okay? Uh, uh, just give me the hundred, and 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 it it doesn't sound uh, because even if you have a very lopsided utility function, this doesn't seem to make sense. All right, what's the rule that's being used? The rule that's being used is uncertain is uncertain. Yeah. There's a big difference. Unlike what Kahneman and Tversky try to sell us, there's a big difference between uncertainty and certainty. And what's the reason for that, okay? Probability assessments in everyday life are rarely objective. In other words, they're not governed by coin tosses, roulette wheels, or the like. When you invite people to an intimate dinner with a handful of carefully chosen guests and they say 99% they'll come, that means that they want to be counted in but themselves reserve the right to opt out. Okay, that's what 99% means, okay? It doesn't mean 99% objectively. When a contractor tells you that 99% your house will be ready in eight months, you'd better figure at least a year, okay? I have one counterexample to this, by the way. 
In the center of rationality, we have uh, in the building of the Center for Rationality, the Feldman Building on the Hebrew University campus in Givat Ram, uh, they, they, uh, they did a complete uh, reconstruction, renewal, uh, not of the Center for Study of Rationality, but of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the same building. And we were forced to go out of the building and they said, it's going to be ready in two or three months, yes, or four months. And I said, now we're out, we're never going to come back, <laughs> okay? But the truth is that we just got a letter saying that we are, in, that the work is finished and we're invited back in, right after Rosh Hashanah in, in, in two weeks. So I don't know if it's true, we're not back yet, but that's a counterexample. But usually, when a contractor tells you that 99% of your house will be ready in eight months, you'd better figure at least a year. They like the distinction between now and later, and they will come to that afterwards. Hyperbolic discounting, that's one of the uh, items that will come later. There's a qualitative difference in everyday parlance between certainty and probability, 99%. And there's something else going on, by the way. Uh, in psychological experiments, um, the experimenters not infrequently lie. They actually lie to the subjects, okay? Afterwards, they tell them that they lied, but at, at, during the, during the uh, uh, experiment, they actually lie to the subject to tell us something. So, the, so, you know, without actually thinking that this 99% is a lie, people get used to it. They get used to these lies in, 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 uh, um, in, uh, uh, in psychological experiments. So you offer them something like this and say, well, maybe 99%, maybe not. You know, we don't know. So better, better to go to with 100,000, okay? That is example number three. Now we'll go to example number four, risk aversion, which is, uh, here, well, let's spell it out, on what's going on over here. Uh, Rabin and uh, Taylor, two, uh, two very prominent behavioral economists in the Journal of Economic Perspectives 2001, uh, almost 20 years ago, they consider a risk averter whose uh, Neumann Morgenstern utility function calls for rejecting a half half lottery between losing $10 and winning $11 at any asset level. Okay. They, saw, they show that such a risk averter also rejects a half-half lottery between losing $100 and winning $10 billion. Okay, and th that's cor it's correct. In other words, the, 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 uh, the, uh, if you uh, reject a half-half lottery between losing $10 and winning $11, then, uh, then your, uh, although, although uh, it doesn't seem a lot, 10 and 11, yes, Half half, but your your uh, utility function is forced to be so concave that uh, that you get this effect that you you reject the half half. It's 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 uh, it, it, it is it becomes extremely concave, strongly concave, uh, and and you get this. Uh, so the, so the math is correct over here. Okay. Uh, when we say they uh, was uh, they who, who a risk averter who rejects a half half lottery between losing ten dollars and winning eleven dollars, okay. So uh, so this this is obviously uh, if they reject if if they if they reject a half half lottery between ten and eleven dollars at any asset level then if they have a Neumann-Morgenstern utility function, then they should reject 
uh, this uh, between 100,000 and winning 10 billion dollars, this is obviously irrational. Now the rule that these people are following is avoid undue risk. What's going on? Practically, risk aversion refers to considerable risks, okay? When you go on the stock market uh, or you invest in a startup or something like that, you are not talking about 10 and $11. A half-half lottery between losing $10 and winning $11 is contrived. No, it doesn't occur naturally. Nobody is faced with a risk of that kind, okay? It's a trivial risk. So evolution does not apply to it. The rule of avoid undue risk it, it evolved in a context where you're talking about considerable risks, okay? The, it, it, it evolved in a natural setting. It may be mistakenly applied in the contrived Rabin Thaler example to which evolution does not apply. Okay. Uh, people people think don't 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 take risks 10, 11, or, or they, they mistakenly uh, uh, do a proportional thing if they say 10, 11, they they translate this to 10,000, 11,000, or 10 million, 11 million, or something like that, yeah. Uh, but they're not thinking, because they are using rules of thumb, they're not making a, uh, a, 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 a precise analysis, okay? Uh, but the rule of thumb evolved in that way, avoid undue risk, okay? Uh, and and half half is considered undue, and they mistakenly apply it over there. So that is my uh, that is the fourth example. And now we're going to go to the endowment effect, okay? Uh, which we actually referred to before already. The behavior is in an experiment. Subjects first given a Swiss chocolate bar were generally unwilling to trade it for a coffee mug. Where subjects first given a coffee mug were generally unwilling to trade it for a chocolate bar. This is a famous uh, paper by in, in the uh, Beverly Economics Literature, uh, Kahneman, Knetsch, and Taylor, 1991. That's the uh, behavior. Okay, so uh, uh, what, what's going, what's the rule that, that drives this behavior? The rule is prefer your own unless you have good reason not to, okay? Prefer your own, prefer what belongs to you. Analysis. Already the 2,000 year old Talmud notes that a person prefers one measure of his own, we're talking about grain, to nine measures of another person's grain, okay? We're talking here about, this, uh, this was a discussion when a person uh, gives uh, his grain to somebody else to watch, and then this person disappears, and should the, should the person who was uh, entrusted with the grain, should he sell it before it spoils, or should he keep it? So the, the, uh, the uh, law is that, uh, that you should sell, your, uh, you should not sell it. You should keep it, right? You, uh, he, told, he told you to keep it, you should keep it, uh, because a person prefers one measure of his own to nine of another's. Of another. And this is something which really is, it's, I mean, uh, 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 Kahneman, Knetsch, and Taylor really identified a, a something which, is, which exists in nature, yes? Presumably, the reason is familiarity. Would you trade your 2018 Subaru for someone else's? I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't trade my 20. I, I, you know, first of all, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good car. And second of all, uh, I know what's wrong with it. And I don't know what's wrong with the other guys. Yes. I, and I know what's right with it. Yes. Uh, uh, it's, it's avoiding uncertainty. That, that's what we're about. That's what it's about. It isn't that people figured this out rationally, but that it has, it has evolved and worked well for millennia. When does it work well? Under natural circumstances. So it has been internalized and is automatically applied to trivial, contrived situations. And I'm using the word contrived uh, purposely, okay, because these experiments are contrived, okay, uh, to trivial, contrived situations like coffee mugs and chocolate bars where it doesn't really apply at all, okay? We're talking about Subaru's, we're talking about uh, 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 tons of grain, we're not talking about uh, uh, coffee mugs and Swiss bars where it does not apply. So again, we have this same situation that the rule is a good rule, but it is applied in an unusual, in an exceptional, in a contrived situation. Uh, I'm going to bring one more example, uh, which I have planned to bring. And, uh, and then, uh, We'll do a uh, we'll do a summary, and then we'll go back and do some more examples. Perhaps I will uh, get suggestions from the audience. Okay. Now this is a situation where we have artificial flowers. Okay. These, uh, a garden of artificial flowers. We have a laboratory like that at the Hebrew University, and we let bees loose on these artificial flowers. And some of the flowers are blue, and some of the flowers are yellow. Now, what do we do? So in the first two weeks of the bee's life, only the yellow, we give, the, the uh, nectar is given to uh, through tubes in these artificial flowers. What are the artificial flowers? They're just discs, okay? And in the middle is a tube of nectar. Nectar is sugar water, all right? And, and, uh, and we supply sugar waters to only the yellow flowers. And then after two weeks, we shut off the nectar to the yellow flowers and we give the nectar only to the blue flowers, all right? Now this uh, is, an, uh, is actually an experiment that was carried out by a German ecologist by the name of Andreas Berch around uh, 35 years ago, and he never published it. But our, uh, uh, our rational biologist, uh, Avi Schmieder, uh, reported on this experiment. In the first period, the two, two first weeks, the bees learned to visit only yellow flowers, okay? And then we switch on them. In the second, they continue to visit only yellow flowers until they starve to death. They never once try the blue flowers. The blue flowers are staring them in the face and they never once try the blue flowers. They only go to yellow flowers and there's no nectar in the yellow flowers and they starve to death. Uh, and uh, that is what happens. And it's irrational, right? Why don't they at least try the blue flowers once, okay? The rule is go by what you have learned, go by experience. And that's a rational rule. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a rational rule in all natural circumstances. If you were dying of thirst in the desert, okay, actually dying of thirst, 
Would you try to extract water from a stone? <laughs> to the bees, blue flowers are like stones. Okay? They, they, uh, um, they, they, just like to, to uh, blue flowers are like stones are to us, okay? They, they, they know that they cannot get, and, and they're right, yeah? They cannot get nectar from a blue flower. This is the caricature of behavioral economics demonstrations of irrational behavior. It is utterly contrived, utterly unnatural, completely ignoring the way that things actually work, okay? Uh, uh, it, 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 the, the evolution works on what happens in the field. It does, doesn't work on what happens in the uh, laboratory, uh, in Birch's laboratory or in, uh, in our laboratory. Uh, the, the, and, and these rules evolve, okay? Uh, so this is, this is actually sort of sums up behavioral economics uh, experiments. All right. Now I'm going to sum up what we've learned up to now, and then maybe we'll entertain some more, uh, um, and and then we will entertain some more uh, examples from this long list that I had at the beginning. But what are the conclusions from what we uh, have discussed uh, up to now? Um, Economic theory is valid after all. On the whole, people do behave rationally, okay? They don't figure things out rationally, but they behave rationally. It's not true that people don't behave as economists think. Now, behavioral economics is also valid. Indeed, it's very important. Okay, I'm not trying to knock behavioral economics. I'm just trying to shift the emphasis from the is from the sometimes uh, irrational behavior to the usual or often rational behavior. Okay, it's people do not consciously optimize; they follow rules of thumb, also known as heuristics and biases. So it's important to know what the rules are. A restaurant serving wholesome but tasteless food will quickly go out of business. A restaurant has to know that people do not eat in order to get energy. That's not what makes them eat, okay? They eat because they're hungry. They eat because they like tasty food, all right? So that's what makes them eat. So in economics, it's important to know what the rules of thumb are, what the actual rules of thumb are. That's in practical economics, it's very important, all right? So behavioral eco economics is important, but not because it leads to irrational behavior, but because it leads to rational behavior. In short, in short far from contradicting each other, Economic theory and behavioral economics complement each other beautifully. Behavioral economics is what makes economic theory work. It's at the foundation of economic theory, okay? Because it's the behavior that's rational. It's not the, uh, it's not the analysis. It's not the reason. We don't figure things out. So the, those are my conclusions. And now, uh, um, Ziv uh, or, or Galit, what, what, what are the rules now? How much time do I have to continue with the lecture? Uh, what, what is it? The lecture is one hour or what? Yes, it's a hour. total of one hour. One hour, okay. So now let's go back to, uh, to the list of examples. Okay, here they are. Um, do we have any requests? Uh, we've we've got we've gone over 
Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We've gone over the first six examples. Uh, what would people like to see now? Is there, are there any requests? Uh, do you take questions now? No, I don't take questions. I'm, as, I'm gonna take questions in 10 minutes. I would like, if anybody uh, has a request for a particular one of these examples, from eight through 18, okay? Which would you like to see analyzed? Cashmere sweater. Cashmere sweater, okay, let's go to that. Here it is. Okay, the cashmere sweater is actually an example which is a little different from the other examples. Because in the other examples, we had a case where the rule is good, but the application of the rule in the particular case, because, because the, uh, the particular scenario was contrived or unusual, led to a bad answer. In the cashmere sweater, which is, we'll see right away what it is, we actually have an example where the, uh, the rule is in fact a good rule, okay? Let's look at it. Okay, it's, it's, it was uh, cited by uh, uh, the early co economists as contradicting um, uh, mainstream economic theory, but in fact, I think it doesn't, okay? So here's the behavior. Lee's wife gives him an expensive cashmere sweater for Christmas, all right? He had seen the sweater in the store and decided that it was too big of an indulgence to feel good about buying it. He is nevertheless delighted with the gift. Lee and his wife pool all their financial assets. Neither has any separate source of money. Okay. That is the example that's brought by Richard Taylor in his book, Misbehaving. Okay, misbehaving is his attractive uh, word for uh, setting out behavioral economics. He says, uh, Taylor says, this is inconsistent with economic theory. Lee feels better about spending family resources on an expensive sweater if his wife made the decision, though the sweater was no cheaper, okay? And this sounds irrational, okay? It sounds irrational to Thaler, okay? I don't know to how many of you it, uh, it sounds irrational. Let's, uh, let's uh, look at this closely. It's irrational. Okay, what's the rule? The rule is appreciate your wife's love. Okay, and uh, that's economics also. Analysis. I don't know about Dick Taylor, but many of us value our personal relationships very highly. Lee's wife gives him the sweater as a sign of love. Lee realizes this and appreciates it. It makes him feel good that he really likes the sweater also for its own sake and was even considering buying it makes him feel all the better, okay? There's nothing irrational about this, okay? In our humble opinion, it's really strange to consider this a challenge to economic theory, i.e. irrational. Rationality is about promoting your goals but not only your financial goals, come on, yes. 
Uh, you want to be, uh, like I say, many of us value our personal relationships very highly. So th this, is, uh, this appears in, uh, in Dick Thaler's uh, book, yeah, 2015, just five years ago. Uh, and it's really odd. Besides, this is a Christmas gift. Surely Lee expects money to be spent for that. He's justifiably delighted that it was spent on something he really wanted. Even ignoring immaterial goals, okay? How does this, uh, how is this inconsistent with economic theory, all right? So that's the cashmere sweater. Uh, yes, yes. Carl, yeah. Okay. Uh, All right, now we've done the cashmere sweater. Uh, uh, oh, we did hyperbolic discounting also. Uh, no, we didn't do hyperbolic discounting. Oh, we did? Uh, no, we did, uh, we did the endowment effect. Okay, is, is, are there any requests for one of these? I think we have time for one more example before. How about generosity? Generosity, okay, let's go to that. Uh, or the dictator game. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the setup. An, ex an experimental subject, uh, D, the dictator, is endowed with a non-trivial sum of money, perhaps $20, and is told that he may either take it all for himself or give part of it to some specific other person, R. Here it's not the responder, here it's the receiver, whom he does not know. He doesn't know who the receiver is. In other words, he can take the $20 for himself or he can give part of it to somebody else, not necessarily poor, not necessarily rich, not necessarily needy, uh, uh, not necessarily, we don't know anything about it, okay? Just you can give it to another person, part of it. Behavior. Many subjects give away a considerable part sometimes as much as 30% to this other anonymous person. The rule is be generous, okay? That's the rule these people are following. Analysis. In repeated interactions, cooperation is known to be rational. It may then take the overt form of generosity in repeated interactions, okay? I help you today ostensibly without any quid pro quo, and you help me tomorrow also ostensibly without any quid pro quo. This is rational because people expect others to be forthcoming, and if they are not, may well punish them. Okay, so we have the uh, rule of generosity of uh, cooperation and in repeated interactions, uh, but not in one-time interactions. But now even in one-time encounters, generosity may well be rational. Rather than keeping accounts of who helped whom, when, it may be simpler just to be generous as a rule. Because life is a repeated interaction, okay? Many human interactions are at least potentially repeated a long term. In such cases, acting generously as a rule, yes, throw your bread upon the waters, okay, uh, will work vis-a-vis -vis others who also are generous as a rule. 
and it will also work vis-a-vis -vis others who do keep accounts. So the observed behavior is rule rational, but it definitely is not rational. It's rule rational, but it's not rational. Why should the dictator grant anything at all to a totally anonymous receiver? If he wants to be generous, why doesn't he take the entire endowment, then grant a part to a needy relative or a worthy cause or whatever he deems appropriate? Um, so that's our analysis of, uh, this is a good example of our main thesis that rules of a raw have evolved and so do not work in contrived artificial in, uh, situations of which the dictator game is a prime example, okay? Uh, that, that's, uh, that is, a, the dictator game is pro contrived artificial. It's not rational. It's not rational to give away, uh, uh, to give away five dollars to somebody who you don't know at all. Yes, just take money out of your pocket and give away five dollars. If he was needy, okay, but uh, it doesn't make any sense to do it this way. All right, I think uh, this. Uh, um, uh, completes our one hour lecture and I say to you thank you very much and I will put on the uh, screen the uh, reference to the uh, published version of this. The published version did not take, it did not have all these examples, it had only a small number of them. So now we will open the floor to questions. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, very appealing, and it makes one wants to formulate a theory of synergy creation. So rules of thumbs in what space, and what is, how do you uh, formulate the things that work often, but not always, and formulating things that are contrived, that are small, small probability, one wants to say, but uh, it's hard to think of this, how to formulate the spaces that you do. So it's, uh, I don't know what the theory of synergy creation, it, it's not a theory of how people behave. It's a theory of how the evolution is created over time. I mean, do you go through evolution theory to formulate the ideas that you, that is very appealing, uh, you know. It's a very good question and uh, yeah, and it deserves a, a, a good answer. I think at this, uh, uh, let me give two answers. One is that at this point, the theory, the, the, these examples, I think, uh, uh, it should be treated one by one on the level that they have been treated in this lecture, okay? Mm. Uh, there are many, many more examples. I mean, if you look up heuristics and biases on the internet uh, or in Google, you Google it, yes, uh, then, uh, then you will find a list of a hundred heuristics and biases, okay? You want to go through all of them. There, there is... Uh, uh, um, uh, there are many, many uh, ex uh, heuristics and biases which want to be treated carefully, but I think maybe at, in the first instance, it's, uh, it's worthwhile to do this non-mathematically, okay? On the level in which I did it in my paper in Nature Human Behavior and on the level in which I did it in this lecture. Uh, because I think that, that those things, those, uh, those exact, that, that's, that shows that, that these things are not theoretical, that they really work and they really make sense. That's one answer. And another answer, which is equally good, is that uh, in fact, uh, um, 
a uh, what's his name uh, Winter Eyal Winter and Yuval Heller have published a paper called Rule Rationality. That's the name of their paper. They published it now. I forget which journal, but uh, it's one of the uh, uh, maybe it's the it's maybe it's the JPE. I, I don't remember exactly. Okay, but you know I'll I'll uh, I'll send you uh, the reference to it. And in fact, it's cited it's cited in in uh, in the Nature Human Behavior Winter Heller and Winter. Okay, Rule Rationality, and they they what they what they do is exactly what you suggest. Uh, build a formal mathematical model which investigates these ideas on a formal level uh, saying when, which is, and it's also, and, and I'm impressed with your question because it indicates that, that the, their paper is even more important than I thought. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? <laughs> yes, yes. So, so you mean that you have some <laughs> toposies or something when we can apply rules? So, for example, I, I as a behave as a decision maker, I face a problem. I put it in a topos in a category. Sorry for my kid. And uh, sorry. <laughs> And uh, and if 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 when I when I when I put it in this box, then I apply the rule which belongs to the box, belongs to the category of these as uh, is current problems. But can do you have any idea why those boxes look like as they look like? So how these boxes appear from or or distill from the many examples we face during our life. Okay, so so I mean that we, we face these concrete decision problems and somehow we make categories of these problems and then this category, we, we apply rules, the problems in the given category. And as you mentioned, there are some cases when the category contains exact problems, concrete problems, which not 100% uh, fits to the rule we apply. So these are the uh, counter examples, or these are the which are not rational when we apply the rule rational rule, let me say, if I'm, if I'm clear, perhaps, perhaps I'm not clear. I, I, I think um, you are describing a process which actually occurs naturally, okay? Uh, in other words, people do not pick a category in which to put the uh, uh, in which to put the scenario in which they're in. They don't pick a category, and it's not as if they say, "Hey, what this scenario is." Uh, is I'm, I'm in a situation now. What category should I put it in? Uh, um, a, a, and then they put it in that category and they press the button and out comes the behavior. That's not what happens, okay? They don't consciously do that. What happens is that they automatically, without being aware of putting it in a certain category, they put it in that category, all right? And then they act accordingly without pressing any button. They act accordingly. So the the uh, the your question is how the, how how does the uh, uh, how is the um, how is that category selected by nature? How is that category selected by uh, psychology? Okay. Well, this. Uh, um, at this point, it's an interesting question. Yes, uh, uh, but at, at this point, I think in most of the examples that we that we gave over here, and these are most of the examples, are, and, and, and these are all taken from the literature of behavioral economics. Uh, the these uh, uh, okay um, when when you are 
let's take let's take examples of uh, from from the uh, lecture. Okay, uh, let's go back. Okay, uh, let's take uh, overeating, all right? Let's take the first example. The first example is this obese person is faced with food, okay? And he eats, all right? Uh, he eats and, and, and uh, I think we're naturally in this situation of uh, applying the rule of eating and hunger. There's, there's no other situation eating when you're hungry, okay? Obese people are hungry even though they're obese, all right? Or take the ultimatum game. The ultimatum game naturally fits into a, a, uh, a into a, um, uh, into a, a situation of bargaining, all right? It naturally fits into that situation. It looks, it, the rules are a little different, but I think the, the, the practical question of the situation that it fits into, is, it's not a problem in the ultimatum game, all right? In the 100% versus 99%, it's also not a problem, okay? Uh, in the risk aversion, it's also not a problem. In all these cases that we took, and these are cases that come from the behavioral economics literature. Right? And these are cases that are used by the behavioral economists to show that people often behave irrationally. They don't say usually. They say usually they behave rationally, okay? But they say they often behave. So in these, in, 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 uh, I think in uh, all or almost all the cases in this uh, list, we uh, uh, the the uh, the rule to apply uh, sort of jumps out at you uh, given the situation. Now you are asking a question: What happens when it doesn't jump out at you? What happens when uh, when uh, you don't know what rule to apply? Well, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. First, I I am first want to sell the idea that behavioral economics is important because it usually works well. And for that, I take their examples. I take the examples of the behavioral economists, okay? Now, I, I think the, the question is partly dealt with in the, uh, in the paper of the Winter and Heller. Uh, and uh, the, the question of which uh, which situation to uh, to um, apply this to? Okay, it's a good question in general, but and, and 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 I'm glad of this question because we're looking forward to what happens uh, in the in the uh, as this uh, research progresses. Uh, thank you. I think this is a typical example when the answer has the. Uh, the people who, the guy who made the question, put the question in a much more clear way, clear way. So, so, so if you if you have rules, then you know rule and categories uh, go together. Because if I have a category, then I have a rule for it. So when we talk about rule rationality, perhaps we can talk about category rationality too. Uh, no, it's the rule that's rational. It's applying the rule to that category. That is what's rational. Okay? Yeah, but, but the question is why this category? So, and if you say that, okay, because there is some rationality, the category to form, then perhaps we the can say that. Okay. That's what you have to solve with your behavior. That's what you have to address with your behavior. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Right. So I, I think it's a very nice discussion of all these examples. First, to comment to this with categories. I mean, there are people in linguistics who look at categories as being endogenous, fitted to the environment for survival uh, and things like that. Cognitive, co cognitive science, they deal to some extent with that problem. But I, I just wanted to say that uh, the, the exposition, I think, is in line with evolutionary theory uh, and also with Milton Friedman's thinking in the 1950s. If you remember his Milton Friedman, when he wrote his book on the methodology of economics, uh, there's a famous uh, discussion there of 
profit maximizing firms and where he says it's not the point that we believe that managers solve complicated max optimization problems but we believe that they behave as if they did because otherwise they would fare ill in the market so it's an evolutionary argument that says it's not that we believe that they solve the problems but they have rules maybe rules of some you know marking up prices and doing things if they work well they continue with the rules so i mean i think it you tie in with an old tradition uh, also herb simon was into this discussion right um, and if you yeah. go to bio in, into biology there is also this distinction between the proximate goal and the ultimate goal so uh, in the case of overeating there is an ultimate goal, goal of getting uh, energy right the yes, proximate yes. goal is that nature gives us feelings of hunger and so on and that's yeah. So I think it hangs together very well with, with such theories. Yes, very good. Thank you very much for that remark. Uh, so I'm learning something. That's why I came here. Uh, um, I think uh, this matter of the proximate goal and the ultimate goal, is, the way I have put it is also that uh, biologists look at two basic questions. One is how and one is why, okay? Why do people eat? What's the adaptive goal of eating? It's to get energy. It's to get, uh, to get uh, calcium for your bones. It's, uh, how, how, is this, uh, how is this carried out? It's carried out by hunger, yes. That, that's the way it's done. So that's, uh, that's another way of looking at proximate knowledge. Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, so who has written about this proximate and ultimate goals? I think it's, I, I will look for some, some references, but it's usually, you know, evolutionary theorists and biologists, they usually make this distinction and talk about that. Uh -huh. Good, good, good. Well, this is, this is evolutionary theory. Yeah, that's what we're evolution. trying to do here. We're trying to, to, uh, um, to show that the, all of these rules and the, the uh, biases and heuristics of uh, behavioral economics are uh, the result of evolution. That, that's what it is. And that's why they don't apply in contract situations because they will, just like the, the bee, yes, you, you don't get a, you don't get a, uh, uh, you don't get nectar switching uh, colors uh, in, in nature, okay. <clears throat> I was going to ask about what a contrived situation is or what a usual situation is, because of course you're incredibly um, convincing, but not most others are not, or at least I'm not. And so you're saying it's contrived. What defines a contrived situation? Maybe because it's experimentalists that wrote it up, but then what defines yeah, a usual yeah. situation? But I just have one example that doesn't make it usual. Usual, like with Kali's argument, there are many um, situation that will make it usual. So how do I know what usual is? How do I know what contrived is? Well, you have a good question for usual, yes. But uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, I'll return to that in a minute. But your, your question about contrived has an easy answer, yes. Let's go through all these examples. The contrived means just that, contrived, okay? Uh, in the ultimatum game, yes, uh, we are taking and uh, we are modeling a bargaining situation. But we're modeling a bargaining situation in a contrived way where people, it's contrived to have people uh, 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 not see each other when they're bargaining with each other. Contrived means that you set things up, you contrive them, you, have, you build them in a way which is not the usual, which is not, it's never used, never. You never have a bargaining situation in which the people don't know each other, okay? So that's what contrived means. A hundred percent versus ninety-nine percent. You don't get that kind of situation uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in nature. In uh, risk aversion, you don't have risk. You you take risks on on the on the uh, on the uh, stock market. You take risks. Uh, um, you take all kinds of large large risks, but you don't take a risk of a half half. 10 or $11, nobody does that, yes, it, even the, the, uh, the uh, uh, it, in, in other words, I don't have a rule defining it, but I think it's obvious, and the endowment effect, who gives it, yes, who, uh, uh, um, uh, 
gives the uh, um, uh, a mug, so you say you want to change your mug for a Swiss chocolate bar, it's obviously artificial, yes? I, 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 I don't have to give a definition. I think it's, it's, it's obvious, yes? Uh, the bees, the artificial flowers, and the nectar. This is this is uh, uh, um, this is uh, uh, it's it's highly contrived. These artificial flowers, and the, the fact that you have artificial flowers, and you can give nectar to some of them when you want, and not nectar to it. It's it's, it's obviously contrived. So you have all these. Uh, you have all these situations uh, uh, which the uh, contrived means that the experimenter built this situation in order to get the effect that he wants to get, and he gets it. Okay. Unusual. All right. Uh, any more questions? No, but you didn't answer what usual is. Usual is, usual is, uh, I think, all right, uh, good, good, thanks for reminding me. Uh, usual is something that, uh, that is less well defined, okay? Usual means actually usual, okay? So for example, in overeating, let's take that example. In overeating, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, the um, uh, it, it's not usual to be obese. It's not usual in evolutionary time scale. All right. Now uh, most of these most of these uh, uh, rules evolve uh, in in uh, by learning. In other words, cultural evolution. But this is not cultural evolution. This is biological evolution, and biologically people uh, uh, were not obese because life was too rough, yes, to, to get obese. It was too difficult to get food. And, and even if you got food, uh, you, uh, it was too difficult to, uh, you had to work hard for it. So, so uh, um, uh, obesity, it was not usual. So in the overeating example, uh, it's something that did not happen. Uh, let me, I'll give another example, and this is an easy, uh, a, a, an interesting example, because uh, I'll give an example of, of uh, what's uh, not usual, okay? I'm going to go to the choosing a, a, a higher probability of getting killed in combat, okay? Oops. The bombing mission. Okay, so uh, during World War II, a squadron of American bombers based on the island of Saipan was assigned the mission of flying 25 bombing sorties to Tokyo, 2,000 miles away. Uh, because of the great distance, most of the weight that the bombers could carry was needed for fuel. This is a true story. Very little could be used for bombs. The mission was very dangerous. In similar previous missions, only a quarter of the airmen survived, a quarter. As the mission was about to begin, an operations research officer arrived from Washington with a brilliant proposal. Half the airmen, to be chosen by lot, would fly just one sortie, but it would be one way. Thus, much more weight could be devoted to bombs, and in that single one-way sortie, as many bombs could be delivered as in 25 round-trip sorties. And each airman's survival probability would increase from one quarter to one half, okay? So you're twice as lucky to survive, uh, twice as, as uh, likely to survive. Behavior, the airmen unanimously refused the offer. When individually asked why, 
each replied that he is a better pilot than average, that he will not be shot down. Now, what's the rule that they were using? Uh, in the army, look ahead just one day, especially in a war, yes, uh, in, in, uh, in an active army. Look ahead just one day. Tomorrow will take care of itself. That's the rule. I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, it's not explicit, yes, but it's what people go after. Especially in a war, changes are so rapid and unexpected that it makes no sense for soldiers to make long-term plans. The airmen were following this rule subconsciously. Okay. And it's a good rule, okay? It's a good rule, uh, even, even not in a war, okay? When you are in the army and you, you are told that, that, uh, that you can take leave uh, uh, for, uh, um, you, you can take leave this weekend or next weekend is Christmas, you can take leave for Christmas, uh, or you can take leave this weekend. And a buddy comes up to you and he says, uh, 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 look, uh, um, uh, I, I have leave, I, I'm, I, I'm scheduled to get leave for Christmas, uh, but I want to go home specifically for this weekend. Uh, would you like to uh, swap, swap with me and you can go home for Christmas, okay? So uh, who doesn't want to go home for Christmas? But you say no, because uh, maybe all leaves will be canceled next week, or maybe everybody will be allowed to go home. Anyway, that's how it is in Israel. Not with Christmas, but with other holidays. So uh, it, 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 you follow this rule, okay? Tomorrow will take care of itself. Now, an irrelevant postscript. The story has a beautiful, surprising denouement. After three sorties, this is a true story, the island uh, of Iwo Jima, 600 miles from Tokyo, fell to the Americans, and the Saipan mission was canceled. So the airmen had been right. The unconsciously adopted rule worked. Now, that does not change the irrationality of the decision, since a priori the cancellation was unlikely. They were being stupid, they were being offered a chance to, 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 uh, to, uh, uh, to double the chances of living, okay? Uh, but they rejected it. it, it uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fact that this was unusual, okay, the, the, the uh, usually it, it, uh, it would have, uh, it, it would have, uh, um, it would not, it, it would not have worked. This was an unusual situation, okay. This was related by Kenneth Arrow, who attributed the story to, uh, to, um, uh, to flood, to marrow flood. Um, I think the the definition of unusual is uh, has to be in in every case separately. In other words, we have situations which are uh, which are um, where where the rule works. Okay. Uh, and and uh, we have situations where the rule uh, uh, we have in most situations the rule where sometimes the rule doesn't work. I don't have a good. I, maybe I should I should work on that on the on the uh, on the uh, uh, definition of unusual. Maybe the the best uh, the best example I think is that of of. Uh, OPC, let's go through some of the other things, the other uh, examples. Um, uh, 
I think my, in most of these cases, we're talking about uh, a, uh, we're talking about, um, let's, let's talk about Selton's umbrella for a moment because uh, it's an interesting situation also. Uh, I think we have usual, uh, we have the, uh, this business uh, of usual and unusual over here. Um, okay, the late Professor Reinhard Selton took an umbrella everywhere, even to Israel's Negev desert in, uh, desert in midsummer when it never rains, okay, it never rains. The rule is go by experience, okay? Selton lived in Germany and uh, he, he traveled quite a bit around the world, but he basically lived in Germany. And, uh, and in, in, in Germany, uh, you can never tell when it's gonna rain and when it's not gonna rain. In the winter and the summer, it doesn't matter, okay? You can go out, the weather can be perfectly good and uh, and uh, and then it starts raining and and Selton was too often caught without an umbrella okay uh, so uh, so so he, he was caught without an umbrella so he, he he decided to take an umbrella you know even though he was a highly rational person he decided to take an umbrella everywhere and that's the end of it so Selton lived in Germany, where it may always rain, even if the sky is completely blue when you go out. He internalized his experience and went by it. Could not be bothered to adjust his habits to the particular place in which he found himself. This is admittedly an extreme instance of rural rationality in which a decision maker is himself aware that he is adhering to the rule rather than fitting his behavior to the particular situation at hand. So what's unusual over here? Unusual is for Selton to be in the Negev desert. Okay, that's unusual. It's not contrived, yes. He went to the Negev desert in order to uh, accompany his good friend, uh, Avi Shmida, our biologist who I already mentioned. Uh, there's nothing contrived about this. But for Selton, it's unusual to be in the Negev Desert. He, he, he decided he's going to take his umbrella everywhere. Okay, that's unusual. Uh, so I, I don't have a, 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 a rule which formalizes this. I understand that this is a mathematical game theory seminar and the mathematicians are always looking for ways to formalize things. But this, I said right at the beginning already, this is not going to be mathematics, all right. So, uh, so that is uh, that is the uh, situation. Okay, uh, are there any more questions? Um, if not, can I ask you, Israel? So, this here is a rule of thumb: create a contrived situation and take advantage of people who use rules of thumb. Yeah, How is right. this, is this a good agenda for game theory? It's a good agenda for behavioral economics, yes. <laughs> okay. Ma uh, many, uh, many uh, people uh, make uh, a lot of money uh, out of it. Excuse me? What did you many say? Many people make a lot of money out of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, and here is the the paper. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo.